It's an absolute pleasure to welcome the Honourable Ted Davey, MLA, Premier of Victoria, the Honourable David Davis, MLC, Victoria Minister for Health, the Honourable Louise Asher, MLA, Victoria Minister for Innovation, the Honourable Gavin Jennings, MLC, Victoria Shadow Minister for Health, the Honourable Justin Madden, MLA, Victoria Shadow Minister for Innovation, Mr Wade Cooper, MLA, Parliamentary Secretary for the Shadow Minister for Health, Ms Georgina Crozier, MLC, Ms Catherine King, Parliamentary Secretary for Health and Ageing, representing the Federal Minister for Health, the Honourable Tanya Trubasek, Dr Andrew South, Part MP, Shadow, Shadow Parliamentary Secretary for Primary Healthcare, representing the Leader of the Opposition, the Honourable Mr Tony Abbott, MHR, Mr Adam Grant, MP, Deputy Leader of the Greens and uh, our local member, the Honourable Peter Dutton, MP, Shadow Minister for Health and Aging, Mr Sophie Mirabella, Shadow Minister for Innovation, Industry and Science, Elder Colin Hunter from the Wurundjeri Tribe Land Cultural Heritage Council, Mr Leon Davis, President of the Wealth and Livelihood Institute Board and Board Members, Sir Gustav Nossel, Honorary Governor and Patron of the Institute and Lady Nossel, Professor Sir David Lane, Sir Roderick Carnegie, Lady Anna Cowan, Lady Barbara Steele, distinguished guests and dear friends and colleagues. Hopefully no one else is going to have to do that. We've got a lot of it. Welcome to the opening of the redeveloped Boston Lazarus Institute of Medical Research. This is a fantastic day for us. We're delighted that you can share it with us. It's been a seven or eight year journey of planning and construction and a $185 million investment, and you'll hear more about that. I'd like to welcome uh, Elder Colin Hunter um, to, to form uh, the ceremony. Thank you very much, Colin. Well, firstly, I'd like to start off by acknowledging that this morning we are making on the lands of my ancestors, the Warrantara people. And I'd like to take this opportunity to pay my respects to my elders, both past and present, elders from all nations, and never ever encountered today. Right. Woman, thank you, welcome. The Warrantara people, you can come to get it. The Warrantara people, welcome everyone to the land side. Warrantary country extends from the Hennessy of Melbourne. It goes across the mountains of the Great Dividing Range, west of the Warrior River, south of the Warrior Creek, and east of Mount Baldwin. And the Warrantary people are part of the Gulen Nations and the Warrior Hamish Group. Hello, my name is Colin Hunter Jr. I will pull her, when possible. I am able to give one of my grandmothers here at Boyd. I'm a proud and passionate second generation of my name and a direct descendant of Gibbonton, who was nothing better or head of the tribe at that time that first settlement. It's through my grandmother, Gavin Bryan, made me wiped up, or only tiny or never she was known to us more, that I have had the culture and heritage in my life to raise up the other side of the stand. My grandmother was one of the last Aboriginal people born in the early 1920s of her current recognition in Hillsville. Before she got moved up to Barma on the Murray River, New South Wales. In Aboriginal culture, a great deal of respect is given to the land, the plants, and the animals alike. And you would have noticed I placed some gum leaves down there on the, on the ground. Please, if you get a chance, grab one and put in your pocket for the day. The significance of those I've kept safe while on country and give the ancestors the rest of the way on country. While you're on Warren Drake country, you welcome there from the cross of the trees. To the rest of the earth. So warm deck, welcome. Thank you. I'd like to ask the President of the Washington Law Institute Board, Mr. Leon Davis, to take the podium. Leon. Thank you very much, Doug. And uh, I'm not going to attempt to go through uh, and thank uh, or acknowledge all the people that Doug did. 
other than to say I too add my welcome and the welcome of the board to you all here today. So what a wonderful day. $185 million spent, and I've got to tell you, spending $185 million is no easy task, <laughs> although some of us did it a bit easier than others. It was done with a great deal of professionalism, dedication from everybody who was involved with this. And I think the reason for that was that there were no passengers, there were no people just shuffling paper, everybody did their job, did it very, very well, and I think it's because it was Walter and Eliza Hall Institute of Medical Research. But I'd like to acknowledge our major donors. First of all, the federal government that donated $50 million. And I'd like to say here that we first took this project over with John Howard, and I'm sorry he can't be here today to uh, hear our acknowledgement for the efforts that he made to ensure that this project had the passage through Cabinet that it ultimately did. I'd also like to thank the State Government who matched the, the Commonwealth with $50 million and that was done during the Premiership of Mr John Brumby and I'd like to acknowledge the efforts that he made. Actually, he made two efforts. He was treasurer, so he had to conserve the cash, and then he became premier, so he could spend it. Uh, so we should thank him twice. But I'd also like to acknowledge the continuing work that the, the government of Mr. Bayview is, uh, is doing to, acknowledge, to, to help and foster the great spirit here at Walker and Eliza Hall. Another major donor uh, was Atlantic Philanthropy, headed by that marvellous man, Chuck Feeney. Uh, Chuck has been a great supporter of us, and uh, he supported this project very willingly and uh, to a large degree. The Australian Cancer Research Foundation, again, was a great donor. The Ian Potter Foundation. There's not too much that goes on in Victoria or indeed Australia without the Ian Potter Foundation having knowledge of it or an involvement in it. And again, the Ian Potter Foundation has been supportive of the work we do. And the Drakenberg Trust, a great uh, supporter of us, again, was a, a donor to this. And of course, the Walter and Eliza Hall Institute of Medical Research itself. We, we high, had to make up the shortfall in contributions we had to get to the uh, designated $185 million uh, of, of expenditure. And this came from our very precious corpus. Also, WeHi was the sole guarantor for this. So, so any cost overrun had to be borne by us. So there is very little wonder that everybody at WeHi was very focused on making sure that this project came in on time and to budget, and it did. This was a remarkable achievement. And it was really due to our board and executive who watched over the project very, very carefully from inception. And I'd like to acknowledge here the, the work of the board committee that was formed for the, for the supervision of this building and this was chaired by Mike Fitzpatrick and to Mike I've said this before and I'll say it again you did a sterling effort for us and we high owes you a great deal of gratitude and the executive Suzanne Corey our then director who first initiated the work here I'd like to thank you and acknowledge you for what you've done uh, and Doug, who uh, took up uh, the, the challenge when he became director and saw this through to completion. To Maureen O'Keefe, uh, who was the manager of the project for WeHi, many thanks. And of course, the State Government's Department of Innovation and Health, who gave strong support from the beginning and gave strong support to the building committee. To our neighbours who put up with an awful lot, if any of you have ever been a neighbour to a building project, 
Do you know what I'm talking about? And we had lots of neighbours around here who grinned and bear on the, the noise and the dust because they knew that growing here was something that was going to be worthwhile for many years to come. Finally, I'd just like to thank the builders of Balderson and the hundreds of uh, builders who actually put the building up. Builders have been getting a bit of a bad press lately, but I'd like to say here that the builders did a great job and have built a lasting uh, contribution to this state and, and to our country. This building is not only a beautiful structure, but it's a triumph of technology inside and out. And it's so very important that we give our scientists the best technology because technolo technological development and medical advances go hand in hand. Just as we are in the midst of a technological revolution, then so we are in the midst of a medical revolution. The technology is the gateway to all things. And if you think about it, it was technology that brought us many, many things. If it wasn't for the technical development of musical instruments, we would never, ever have had a Mozart. If it wasn't, if it wasn't for the technology of the written word, and of our language, we would never ever have had an Einstein or a Shakespeare. So all of that can be brought back uh, to technology. And likewise, from technology, great things are going to come here. Thoughts will be turned into words, and words into deeds, marvellous deeds in our hospitals, in our uh, our doctor's surgeries in our medical centres, not just here, but around the world. And at a time like this, I think it pays to reflect on why are we doing this in Parkville and in Melbourne. There are several reasons. The first is to keep and foster the flame of in inspiration first lit by Walter and Eliza Hall nearly 100 years ago. The foresight of these remarkable Australians needs our constant reflection, if only to ensure that their generosity acts as a beacon for the generosity of others. And one thing to remember, that the money that Walter Hall had came from perhaps the first mining boom in Australia. His money came from the Mount Morgan mine in Queensland, and I think it shows and stands in testament of the good things sometimes we don't even think of that come from the, the great resources that Australia has. The second reason we're doing this is because it is needed. Although our country has attained wealth that our forebears could never ever have dreamed of, then we would think that we would be well on the way to controlling and, uh, and eliminating disease, but we still have a long, long way to go. For example, all of us have either been near or afflicted by terrible diseases such as cancer, and ridding the world of this dreadful affliction is one of the most no noble causes that any society can undertake. The third reason is because we can. It is only a few hundred years ago that almost everyone on this planet was totally absorbed with where their next meal was going to come from or what shelter they had. Now, no longer. Our society has developed to such an extent that we have the luxury of having time to think. This is an advantage only available to wealthy countries and we should exploit it to the full, not only for ourselves, but for the world. And the fourth reason is the economic imperative. Developed countries the world over are grappling with the real threat of services declining as the result of an increasingly ageing workforce. Successful medical research 
coupled with technology, is the only way to control the spiralling costs of medical care. And so, as we approach our first 100 years, I can report to the members of Walker and Liza Hall that your institute is in good shape. The only real challenge we have is to seek ways of becoming less dependent on government, or put a better way before our, our government leaders race off to cut the budget, put a better way, it's how can we enhance the government assistance that we do get. We would like to grow our corpus faster so that we have more privately funded income so that we could spend work on bringing on new and young researchers and to release our scientists from the need to seek funds rather than what they should do and seek solutions. We want everyone in this institute to, vote, to devote all their time to seeking cures from the scars of disease and to follow the words of Tennyson, to strive, to seek, to find, and not to yield. Thank you. Thank you very much, Doug, and I'd like to um, add my very warm welcome to all who have joined us here today, friends and supporters of the Institute, politicians, members of the board, staff, you're all here, and there was light. <laughs> we thought it was going to be raining, but in fact, um, we said our magic incantation, let there be light, and there was. So for many in the audience, this day is a, day, a dream come true, a dream that grew into a project of all-consuming proportions. Today, we're going to open one of the most advanced scientific buildings in the world, a building that unites elegant architecture with cutting edge tech engineering. A building that houses the most advanced technologies for analyzing molecules, cells, microbes, mice, and men and women. A building that will inspire and support our scientists to unlock the secrets of life in order to fight and prevent disease a building that will empower the Walter and Eliza Hall Institute deep into the 21st century. Now, Doug has asked me to say a few words about the history that led to this day, some of the stories behind the scenes. And I guess the dream began very early in my directorship when I realized that our much-loved building just behind me here, which was realized in 1984 by Gus Nozzle and Daryl Jackson, had reached absolute capacity. Margaret Brumby told me this every day. By 1999, we had over 415 staff and students crammed into a building that was originally designed for a maximum of 250. We had insufficient space for our current scientists to reach their full potential, let alone for nurturing the next generation of scientific stars. I was acutely aware that science was changing very rapidly, driven by the Human Genome Project. And to remain competitive, we needed bigger teams, drawing together many different disciplines and having access to new technologies. To translate our discoveries more rapidly, we needed capacity to link even more effectively with clinical medicine next door and with industry. And above all, I think, I desperately wanted to give more young scientists the chance to realise their scientific dreams here, in Australia, just as the Institute and Gus had enabled me to do so many years before. Now, the board was rightly very cautious 
but gradually became convinced that if we couldn't expand, the Institute would not remain competitive and our enviable international reputation would wither away. And so began the critical campaign to garner the necessary space and funding. And there's no time today to tell you the full story, but I'd like to recount just a few major moments. Certainly, the pivot was meeting a very remarkable individual, and you've heard about it already this morning from Leon. Chuck Feeney was his name, is his name. He's an Irish-American, and he made his fortune as co-founder of Duty Shoppers, Duty Free Shoppers. However, he was the most unusual man. Unlike most very rich men, he gave away his entire fortune to establish Atlantic Philanthropies, one of the most generous and, at the time, one of the most secretive philanthropic funds in the world. In fact, only in the last few years has Chuck allowed his story to be told in order to inspire others to emulate his example. And during most of the time I interacted with him, um, and still on my computer, the files are marked anonymous donor. <laughs> Feeney had seen Ireland's universities blossom with support from his Atlantic philanthropies, enabling them to ge develop the next generation of researchers and entrepreneurs. He'd become a regular visitor to Australia, and he saw that Australia had great potential to develop its future by building up the biomedical sector. And by the time I met him, he was already strongly engaged with the University of Queensland and the Queensland Institute of Medical Research. Now, Feeney was also involved in a different part of his life with a former Olympic runner, Ron Clark, who, being a Victorian, um, and a, a true Victorian, alerted him to philanthropic opportunities in Victoria. And thus it came to pass that Ron Clark brought Chuck to a meeting at the University of Melbourne. And during a very fateful morning tea in the Vice-Chancellor Gilbert's office, Richard Larkins, who was then Dean of Medicine, and I spelled out a vision that was being developed amongst the inhabitants of the Parkville precinct, not only the university, but the medical research institutes and the hospitals, for further development of this already very powerful science precinct. Chuck liked what he heard, and he went on to recommend investment by the Atlantic Philanthropy Board. Now his principle was that Atlantic Philanthropies should only fund one third of the cost of any project they got involved in, and of course his purpose was to lever additional funding. So we had to set to work, both with grant agencies and with the state and Commonwealth governments, to get the requisite matching funding. For the university, the outcome of that meeting was the magnificent Bio 21 Institute. For us, at the Walter and Liza Hall Institute, funding and development actually took part in two stages. In the first stage, from 2000 and 2001, we filled in the undercroft of the building behind me to house bioinformatics. We redeveloped um, very generously in collaboration with the Royal Melbourne Hospital, two floors that um, um, house structural biology and proteomics. Mm -hmm. And of course, we acquired and developed a really marvelous biotechnology center in La Trobe University's R&D precinct. And these projects were very important. They significantly enhanced our research capability, but they didn't solve the fundamental problem, the severe lack of space in this building our central research building. And actually, after that, there was a long blue period from my point of view, spanning from 2002 to 2006, because although Chuck had encouraged my long-term plans for a new wing to this building, his board, by that time, had introduced a new policy and had stopped funding capital works altogether. And we also, of course, had to undergo very serious and protracted negotiations with the Victorian government and with the Royal Melbourne Hospital in order to be able to expand westward on this site. 
But by July 2004, we'd persuaded the Victorian Government to develop a 10-year Parkville Precinct strategic plan, and this eventually endorsed our expansion. And then came a breakthrough in June 2004. I managed to meet with Chuck in Brisbane and learned that he decided that he was getting old, he needed to spend uh, his entire fund, and that he was going to persuade his board to reconsider funding capital works. And so he invited us to um, make an application to his board very fast, and, and they accepted our application. But then, of course, again, we had to secure matching funding, and this meant for me some very hair-raising negotiations. I'd received a very sympathetic hearing from John Brumby, who was then treasurer, but I couldn't get either Chuck or the Victorian government to make the first move. Neither would commit without commitment from the other. And at one critical stage, I remember in, actually I was at a scientific meeting in Singapore, and I had to sort of rush out, and I had the Victorian government on the phone on one line, and Leon Davis in China on the other, on the other line, and they were trying to get final agreement between Weihai and the Victorian government. But fortunately, as you all know, the state government came through magnificently with the announcement here in November that year by Premier Steve Brax of a 50 million contribution in response to Atlantic Philanthropy's very generous 30 million. And then the next defining moment that Leon referred to earlier. In early 2006, Leon was able to secure an appointment with Prime Minister John Howard in Sydney. And I knew this was a make or break moment. And literally my heart was in my mouth when I walked in with Leon to the Prime Minister and explained why he too should give us $50 million. But he responded so positively that I don't know what you think, Leon, but I've always wondered whether we should have asked a double that amount. <laughs> And so we were able to embark then on the long and very meticulously planned seven-year journey that has led us to this ceremony today. Leon has already thanked the wonderful architects, Denton Cork and Marshall and S2F, the engineers, the builders, and the project managers who have enabled us to realize this dream. And I echo his remarks with all my heart. And I'd also like to acknowledge and thank the many scientists and support staff at the Institute who walked with us every step of this long journey, sharing their experience and insights with the designers to help create our magnificent new western wing, which you'll soon see, refashion the first wing just behind me, and then successively decant us without any major disruption to our research which of course to us scientists was absolutely critical. There are too many to acknowledge individually today, but I'd like to thank in particular my assistant director, Professor Nick Nicola, the former general manager, Dr. Margaret Brumby, the current chief operating officer, Maureen O'Keefe, our facilities manager, Steve Drosky, and of course, our director, Professor Doug Hilton, who took over responsibility for the project and skillfully steered it from 2009 when the major build started. My sincere appreciation also to the Institute's board, particularly the President, Leon Davis, the Vice President, Stephen Scala, and the Chair of the Buildings Subcommittee, Ford's Building Subcommittee, Mike Fitzpatrick, whose dedicated oversight enabled us miraculously to reach the end of this journey on time and on budget. I'd also like to thank the Royal Melbourne Hospital, particularly its chairman, Mr. Robert Doyle, who provided the space to double the size of our footprint in their very already very crowded precinct. And finally, and most importantly, I'd like to echo Leon's words and express our deep gratitude to the generous funders of this magnificent building. The Victorian government, the Commonwealth government, Atlantic Philanthropies, the Potter Foundation, the Australian Cancer Research Foundation, the Brownsteins, and the many, many trusts, foundations, and individuals 
who have donated to the Walter and Eliza Hall Institute over the decades. Your financial support, and just as importantly, your faith in us, have empowered us to tackle the frontiers of knowledge with renewed strength and vigour. And we pledge to you today that your investment will lead to more effective medicines and health care for tomorrow. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Doc. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, it's a great privilege for me to have the opportunity to be president, uh, present at your dream come true, uh, this new uh, Walter and Eliza Hall building. This is important to me for both professional reasons and a major personal reason. The Institute has an amazing record over a long period and those in science and technology such as myself see as a profound, this is a profoundly important part of our modern life. It takes a lot of puzzle pieces to maintain and grow our complex economy and society and keep us healthy. One very important piece is the why is it so? How does it work? So typified by astronomy uh, that I've been involved in, astronomy research, particle physics, and many, many areas of medical uh, and biotech research. The workings of the immune system, the almost daily announcements of parts of the unravelling of the mysteries of the genetic code and, and its expression, the elucidation of a surprising number of paths to diseases such as cancer are but a few examples. The work of McFarlane Burnett, uh, Professors Miller and Metcalf are amongst the standouts that have put the Walter and Eliza Hall Institute at the very forefront of this important pure research piece of the puzzle. I also find it intriguing to see how researchers in the new field of complex systems are highlighting more and more similarities between large physical and societal systems and biological systems. I think we can learn much from biological systems that's applicable in other fields and vice versa. Where will we go next in, in research as we've started in the century of physics uh, and that's morphed into the information and biomed and biotech ages. The next piece of the puzzle to me is how do I fix it? How can I use it? I started in radio astronomy and was later ch uh, challenged by my mentor uh, and boss, Bob Frater, to look for applications of the skills and technologies we had built up. This led to our very successful invention of the technology underpinning Wi-Fi wireless networks. It also led to various startup technology companies and also major returns to CSIRO, which has in turn allowed the funding of a new generation of researchers. These startups, these new companies, by the way, I think are the third important piece of the research and technology puzzle. But there's no time to go into that here. Others have started with the how do I fix it first and then gone back to the how does it work. The war fertilizer uh, all focus on diseases and contributions to treatments for various cancers, inflammatory and infectious diseases has certainly had a major impact. One of these impacts was on me. I have a very personal reason to be honoured to speak at this meeting. Back in 2009, when I found out I was to be awarded the Prime Minister's uh, Prize for Science, I sat down, as you do, to look at the somewhat daunting list of past recipients and their achievements. One recipient was Professor Metcalf. 
And on reading his citation, my attention was caught by the description of CSFs, or colony stimulating factors. Less than nine months previously, I had been undergoing chemotherapy for lymphoma. And one day after each dose of monoclonal antibody, which by the way, as I understand it, is yet another remarkable medical breakthrough, and a number of other more nasty chemicals that were less targeted, I had to inject myself with something which sounded awfully like what Professor Metcalf and his team had developed. This injection stimulated the bone marrow to produce more lymphocytes, helped the immune system to recover enough so that the chemotherapy sessions be more often and more effective. In other words, as far as I understood it, they materially increased my chances of survival. So just as I did in my PM Prize acceptance speech, I would like to take this opportunity to say thank you Professor, uh, Professor Metcalf. Thank you to the extended uh, CSF team I just had the pleasure of uh, uh, hearing from uh, before this opening. Um, and also, thank you, Walter and Eliza Hall. I trust and hope this new building will be the venue for many more equally significant developments and breakthroughs. Thank you for your attention. We mean the donors, the architects, the builders, and uh, engineers, and uh, somebody who doesn't get mentioned often, Darnards, who moved everything from one building to another backwards and forwards, as far as I know, without breaking a single thing. That's the advertisement. Now, who are the uh, staff on whom behalf I'm speaking? Surprisingly, there are 930 of them, and they come from 60 different countries. Handpicked a lot. Now, um, as you might imagine, their skills are as varied as their origin. We have, as you'd expect, scientists who work in the laboratory, science-based, medical-based. We have uh, superb technicians working in the laboratories, supporting their work. Even more superb animal technicians in a high-tech animal facility. They're the ones you'd know about. What you are less likely to know about are the people who sequence the entire genome of whether it be man or mouse, the biomathematicians who figure out the millions of pieces of data that result, the crystallographers. What's a crystallographer? 
they worry about the shape of a molecule, how they can fit a little counteracting molecule into a crevice in that molecule. So we have synthetic chemists, we have people who mass screen, we have people who uh, labour in the background to meet the demands ever increasing of government for accounting for every dollar we spend, whether it be on a piece of equipment or on a house. We have, as you might imagine, our accountants. We have people who uh, service the whole facility, keep us clean, uh, keep us fed. An amazing variety of people. Now, how old are these people? The average age is 36.7. I got them to figure it out. Years ago, we used to take great pride in the fact that the average age was 25. But that was 30 years ago. What's happened since is that medical research has got more and more complex, the technology more and more difficult, takes years of extra work to become uh, adept at using this material. So the age has increased. But the staff is still young, they're still enterprising, they're still eager. And uh, their creed and the Institute's motto is mastery of disease by discovery. Now, the people involved, particularly the long-term projects, have on their hands very difficult programs, very expensive programs, programs that don't always work properly, so they become very finicky and picky about where they're housed, what equipment they use. And these are the terror of architects and builders. They are never satisfied with what they've got. They nag and whine. And uh, it can be a very, very difficult passage of time. This time, everything went, as far as I can tell, extremely smoothly. Now, uh, this new building, as you'll see, is superb. The facilities are superb, the equipment is superb. There is nothing that cannot be discovered in this building, nothing medical. Whether it be uh, cures for cancer, whether it be vaccines for disease, it can be done here. The only thing that limits the accomplishments of this new building will be the uh, vision of the people in it, their enterprise and their capacity for hard work. On that latter question, I have no qualms. This institute has never set out to be the second to discover anything, and we've got no intention of trying so now. So, the staff thanks our donors, thanks our builders for this remarkable new building, and our genuine thanks will come from success in the research that we now have in progress. Thank you. Thank you, John. I'm actually certain John is going to be around in 35 more years when we might open a new building. It turns out that when I come to retirement age uh, of 65, Don will be 100 and he will still be active, I'm sure. Um, it's my very great pleasure to welcome to the stage the Honourable Catherine King, uh, MP, Parliamentary Secretary for Health and Ageing. Catherine. Thank you very much for the introduction to the Honourable Ted Lane, the Premier of Victoria to Professor Dave Corson, the director of this extraordinary community asset we have here in the heart of Melbourne. To Mr Leon Davis, the board president, annual board members, 
to my federal and state parliamentary colleagues, both past and present, who are here with us today. Can I too start by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land on which we gather, and I pay my respects to their elders, both past and present, and thank them for the welcome to country. I'm delighted that today we have Dr Barry Jones here with us. And Barry wrote in his memoir that when he first started talking about biotechnology in the late 1970s, there were only two or three of his parliamentary colleagues who understood what it was that he was talking about. Indeed, when Barry raised the lack of science coverage with the then editor of the Bulletin, he received a disappointing response. When I hear the words science and technology, I close up my typewriter. This distinguished gathering and this magnificent building show how far we have come in just half a lifetime. Today, we understand the fundamental importance of science and medical research for Australia's future, something that those of us in positions of public policy making must rigorously defend. We know that so many of our social and economic problems will have a scientific response at their core from chronic disease and climate change to biosecurity to food production and to water policy. Medicines are now Australia's biggest research intense goods export and are helping to build a stronger, more competitive and a more productive economy. We are proud of supporting Australia's best and brightest health and medical innovators as they undertake their world-leading research. It is the only way we can achieve better health and quality of life. Research underlies the medicines we take and the treatments we undergo and enables our doctors to provide us with effective care. It also underpins the strong economy for an able, healthy population and by generating wealth. We must come to respect our researchers as much as we lionise our sporting styles. We must value our research facilities just as we treasure our sporting venues. So it is entirely fitting that the Walter and Eliza Hall Institute of Medical Research should be in this stunning new home. The Institute is Australia's oldest medical research institute, founded in the year of ANZAC 1915. And it has become a byword for public confidence and trust. More than 650 researchers work here. And this new facility demonstrates in the built form the confidence that we have in you. At $100 million shared jointly between the Commonwealth and the state governments, it is a significant public institution. And I know the people of Victoria and Australia would not begrudge one single cent. We should acknowledge with gratitude the exceptionally generous gift of $30 million which completes the funding of this landmark project. The new wing effectively doubles the Institute's capacity for laboratories, offices and centralised facilities. It means more research into causes and treatments of some of the most persistent and destructive diseases of today, a variety of cancers, infectious diseases, including malaria, HIV, and hepatitis B, and autoimmune diseases. One of the interesting additions is an insectary, a laboratory where researchers can keep live mosquitoes and investigate the malaria life cycle. That's critical given Australia's deep commitment to malaria prevention in the Asia-Pacific region, where more than 40,000 die of this disease every single year. This will be a place of healing and of hope. We know that from the achievements of re of realised here at this facility and by individuals here today, like Professor Metcalf discovering CSX, Benjamin Klein's Kyle's work in molecular genetics, for which he receives the Prime Minister's Prize for Life Scientist of the Year in 2010. John O'Sullivan's amazing work and amazing story. Professor Alan Cowman's internationally recognised medical malaria research. The quality and commitment of the Institute's staff have never, ever been in doubt. And that's been seen in the latest NHMRC round, where the Walter and Eliza Hall received the highest amount of any independent medical research institute across the country. Now you will have the equipment and the facilities to match. Mr Premier, to ladies and gentlemen, the expansion and upgrade will help to ensure that this great institute remains at the forefront of biomedical research, not only in this country, but on the international stage. It is a reminder that we should be ambitious for our nation, for our future and our place in the world. Medical research lies at the heart of that ambition, to be innovative and a creative nation, a nation that values knowledge and values learning. 
to be the clever country that Bob Hill and Barry Jones knew we could be a quarter of a century ago. Today's opening shows it can be done through partnership, shared commitment and a vision for something above the ordinary. The Australian Government is very pleased to support this institute and to have contributed to the new building, which will consolidate your position among the best and brightest in Australia and the world. Thank you. the Premier of Victoria, Ted Bailey. Um, Premier, we are grateful that your government has continued the wonderful tradition of support um, that the Grundy government um, showed to health and medical research. Uh, certainly your investment in infrastructure and the ongoing funding of this institute enables us to be a real magnet for talent, not just around Australia, but internationally. And I welcome you to the stage. about this event is it's not a sporting event, it's a science and research event. And we should all be desperately, desperately proud of the fact that we're here in such numbers on such a beautiful day in such a beautiful location to celebrate this extraordinary building, this extraordinary institute. And I thank you for uh, the privilege of being here. In saying that, I do want to acknowledge some people. I don't want to lead, read through the two and a half pages of acknowledgements that I do have in front of me. I'm not sure there's anybody here who doesn't deserve acknowledgement. But I do want to recognise in particular all of those who've contributed, all of those who are here, but I also want to particularly acknowledge for their contribution those who are not here who have made such exceptional contributions. And I want to acknowledge in the first instance Steve Brax and John Brumby, my predecessors, who as we have heard from Susan and others, commenced with others this process and acknowledge the predecessor governments, treasurers, health ministers, ministers for innovation, and acknowledge those at a federal level as well who are not here but who have contributed. And John Howard has been mentioned. But no doubt, Kevin Rudd and Julia Gillard as well. And the great thing about this event is that this place, this precinct, this institute has brought us all together over an extended period. And that's what's special. It doesn't matter what side of politics we all come from. It doesn't matter where we come from. This institute is special. This building is special. And this is an exceptional day. We should, and we are, I'm sure, very, should be, and we are, I'm sure, very, very proud. Cures for diseases once established and commonplace, can be taken for granted. But the effort, the research, the passion and the commitment which goes with the development of those cures must never be taken for granted. And this institute and this wider precinct, in this wider precinct of learning and research, is an exceptional institute. Now, Leon and his team, and I do acknowledge Leon and his team, have authorised us to describe the Walter and Eliza Hall Institute at this function as we hide. So if I might uh, pick up on that and say 
the way high is to Victoria uh, as important as the MCT. Specky, the speckies you've taken here are just as spectacular. This uh, institute obviously uh, represents so much and offers so much for the future. For the staff, the researchers, the philanthropic contributors, this is an opportunity too, too special to resist, too special to uh, ignore. And for those who've achieved in the past, and I'm a Don, and I'm sure he'll be here at every opportunity. Not just for the building openings, but the openings of new fires, new dawns, new cures, new vaccines, new solutions. Because everybody who's had a part of this institute will play a part long into the future. Can I also just observe, in regard to the precinct here, this is a special place. We honour it through a succession of governments, both state and federal. And the presence here of so many people is a tribute to that. But I do want to acknowledge all of those past and present, including our Indigenous communities. And I note Colin's contribution here today. Who's, uh, and acknowledge all of those whose love of our land, whose care of our country, whose connection to our state, our city, to this place, this institute, have left us with such a treasure. And the history of this state is one of aspiration and ambition and people who settled here and uh, blended with the indigenous communities. And they settled here with very little. Many of them, most of them very young. And they reached into the depths of their imagination and their passion. They built for us extraordinary institutions, many of which are now turning 150 years old. The library, the gallery, the university, and of course the gym. And they built wonderful businesses at the same time. And they built wonderful architecture, which this state celebrates and this city celebrates. And this institute is a part of that long tradition, that core character of this state. It's a core character of ambition and aspiration. And it is, in its own terms, a successor to that tradition I thank everybody involved. It is a pleasure to be here, an honour to be here, and we wish the Institute every success in the search for that next open door, in the search for that next fabulous event, in the search for that next Becky. Thanks very much. Fundamental, curiosity-driven research changes the way we view the world today and when coupled to strategic development provides the foundations for unimagined new industries, improved productivity and better health. Unless you think I exaggerate, consider for a moment the progress we've made in cancer prevention and treatment since the early 1950s when Don Metcalf began training as a medical student. Or in another realm, the progress in communication since John O'Sullivan studied engineering in the mid to late 1960s. In the US, they understand how important research is in the 21st century. And I think from hearing both from um, our federal and state colleagues, we get it here too. I want to quote from President Obama, who made a speech some years ago. I believe it is not in our character to follow, it is our character to lead, and it is time for us to lead once again. So I'm here today to set this goal. We will devote more than 3% of our GDP to research and development. We will not just meet, but we will exceed the level achieved at the height of the space race. Through policies that invest in basic and applied research, create new incentives for private innovation, promote breakthroughs in energy and medicine, 
and improve education in math and science. This represents the largest commitment to scientific research and innovation in American history. Just think what this will allow us to accomplish. Solar cells as cheap as paint, green buildings that produce all the energy they consume, learning software as effective as a personal tutor, prosthetics so advanced that you could play the piano again, an expansion of the frontiers of human knowledge about ourselves and about the world around us, and then in typical Obama fashion, we can do this. And I think with the support of the government and community, we can do this here. And if that doesn't convince you, and you still think that the halcyon days of research are behind us, I urge you over lunch to talk to our researchers, our professors, our laboratory heads, our clinician scientists who work as doctors in the hospital and in our labs, our postdoctoral scientists and technical staff, and most of all, our students. We are fortunate to be on one of the world's great university campuses and privileged to have a screen of our standing University of Melbourne students working cheek by jowl with our experienced staff. Over lunch, talked with the PhD students and the undergraduate students who are working in our labs on their own research projects. And consider, just for a moment, what we can achieve as a nation over the next 50 years if these students who are in their late teens and early 20s, with their burning passion, their sharp intellect, and their commitment to collaboration are afforded the same opportunities to excel as Don Metcalf and John Sullivan. Consider just for a moment what we need to provide these students over their careers in order for them to shine and fulfil their potential. And I think there are, there are three things we need to consider. The first are high quality facilities and thanks to the support from government and the community we can tick that off here. I'd like to thank the community, the main philanthropies, Eddie and Bev Brownstone and the Broken Bird Trust, Lady Potter and the New Potter Foundation, and the donors and staff of the Australian Cancer Research Foundation for their generosity and the faith they've shown in the made the building possible. To remain at the cutting edge, our researchers also need access to state of the art equipment. And again, over the last two years, we've seen some very generous support from perpetual trustees, equity trustees, the Luke Hardy Trust, the Ian Roller Curry Foundation, and the Trust Company. However, I'd also like to sound a clarion call to others who may wish to help in this area. Technology is forever changing and to stay at the forefront requires continuous investment. The second thing we need to do for our students is to provide our researchers with a career structure, some certainty that if they excel and continue to excel, they will be rewarded, not just financially, but with the prospects of stable continue, continuous employment. We also need to ensure that our younger scientists are given an opportunity to shine at a reasonable age. Over the past 30 years, we've become increasingly conservative as a sector, denying our researchers, our researchers the opportunity to investigate their own ideas until later and later in life. It may be hard for some of us to believe that Tom Metcalf was not always the grandfather of Anatoly. In 1954, at the age of 25, as a fresh medical graduate from the University of Sydney, Don was appointed as a Carbon Fellow at the Cancer Council of Victoria to carry out his own research here at the Walton Life of All Institute. At that stage of his career, Don had done one year of research as a being med science student, the first from the University of Sydney, and he had not published a paper. This appointment was based on nothing except potential. And I hope that as research leaders today, we will back our own judgments and appoint young researchers on the basis of, on the basis of their potential rather than having them jump through endless loops before we give them a chance. The decision to support the young girl Metcalf has been repaid 10 million times over. As you've heard, I've discovered the blood cell hormones that produce the side effects of pet therapy. These hormones have been used to help more than 10 million cancer patients. I'm really delighted to welcome 50 such patients, including Don O'Sullivan, to be part of this celebration. It's really part of the Life and Life Institute family. I'd also like to add that this story has another important lesson. The Cancer Council of Victoria has supported Don for the whole of his career, nearly 60 years. Having someone or some group see your potential and be willing to back, be willing to back you is inspirational 
And it is as glad they didn't whack me on <laughs> And it's as inspirational and relevant an ingredient for scientific success today as it was half a century ago. We're very fortunate to have supporters like the Polpro family, John Dyson and Rose Gilder, the John Reed Trust and Bob Munro who carry on this tradition. And I'm delighted that over lunch I'll be able to announce a number of new fellowships to support our medical research. The final thing we need to do is something that you might not think is very important, but I think it's every bit as vital as facilities and personal support, and that is time. Time to do research, time to contemplate, time to read, time to talk and challenge and argue, and most of all, time to think what might be possible. Seemingly, like almost every other walk of life, the energy and entrepreneurship of researchers is being dissipated by ever increasing bureaucracy and red tape. I sometimes wonder how any discovery can make it all. I want to make a very public commitment to my researchers. I'll do my very best to simplify your life. I want to stand next to the recent Nobel Prize winner Brian Schmidt and be at the vanguard of calls to reform the peer review system so that not only can we continue to ensure that the highest possible quality research is funded by Australian taxpayers, but it's done in a way that doesn't endanger productivity or creativity. As we open this building, I also want to pledge to review our own systems to ensure that they are as lean and light touch as possible, facilitating for research excellence rather than dirty researchers. And if you think this is a new problem, I'd like to conclude with a quote from Rebecca Scott's book, Darwin's Ghosts, in which she discusses Leonardo da Vinci working in Milan in the 15th century. Stop notes. In Milan, there was never enough time to attend to anything, never any quiet to pursue trains of thought. There was always a horse. Da Vinci was trying to build a massive sculpture of the horse for the Duke. There was always the horse. There was always the Duke's envoy asking about the horse. <laughs> Maybe that's reporting back on that. There were entertainments designed to design for the Duke's parties and the pupils coming and going. I think that sounds very familiar. Might be a stretch to think Parkville campus can be the Milan or Florence of the 21st century, but I'm optimistic and the Premier has touched on this. I'm optimistic that together we can do something very special. We have the talented and creative people, we have the facilities, we have a collaborative ethos that permeates a campus that includes the Premier University in the country, currently ranked in the top 30 in the world. Four outstanding hospitals, the Royal Melbourne Hospital, the Royal Women's Hospital, the Royal Children's Hospital, and the Peter Mac, which will soon locate as part of the Victorian Comprehensive Cancer Centre Development. Again, another wonderful initiative jointly funded by the state and federal governments. We have the CSIRO close by, and we have Australia's premier biopharmaceutical company, CSL. And as this amazing turnout this morning shows, we have the most important ingredient of all, the support and interest of the community. And again, to quote Obama, together we can do this. I'd like to thank you all for being part of this landmark really an important part of our institute's history. And I'd like those of you that are going to be part of the vote for ceremony, including uh, the Premier and, and Catherine, I'd like you to go to the rope because we're going to count down to the building opening. Have you got shoes for rope for Catherine? I have. Oh, lovely. Can you grab the rope? Right so we have a number of people from different aspects of the Institute on the road, as well as some uh, people that support us from the community. I'm going to, I'd like you all to join with me and count down to the official opening of our new building. And we'll start at 10 and we'll open at 1. So 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1.